we go. Welcome everyone right. to the new fly fisher. In today's show, we are focusing beyond the basics of nymph fishing. There In fact, goes. we're going to learn more about advanced nymphing techniques by listening to several expert fly fishers from throughout North America. Whether you fly fish for steelhead or smallmouth bass, you're going to learn something. <laughs> it's going to be a very technical and yet fascinating program. Stay with us. We begin today's show in the majestic mountains of Labrador. This province of Canada is blessed with incredible beauty and equally incredible fishing. Awesome Lake Lodge first opened in 1991 and offers fly fishing only for giant brook trout on Awesome Lake and the connecting English River system. The lodge is located some 85 air miles from Goose Bay and is the only fishing facility on the entire English River watershed. Bill Bullock, who works for Orvis, is at Awesome Lake Lodge with me enjoying the fishing. Bill is there to endorse the lodge for Orvis and make it part of their fly fishing destinations. I asked him to explain one of his favorite nymphing techniques, which involves using a dry fly as an indicator. My name's Bill Bullock. I work for the Orvis company down in Manchester, Vermont, overseeing their endorsed lodge program. And I'm up here on the English River, up in uh, just southeast of Goose Bay, a beautiful spot out of Awesome Lake Lodge. We're here on the English River, and this pool, this riffle pool right here, is really the first pool that's coming out of Awesome Lake, which is above me. And this looks like a terrific piece of water for a couple of reasons. You've got oxygen-rich water tumbling through here, and you've got a shelf that you can see that starts right here, all the way down through, and tails out into just an unbelievable pool. This fish, I would look at this pool and say this is holding fish all through. Fish are going to have an easy time holding under here. There's a shelf, where they're not going to work hard and food's going to be tumbling through the currents, whether it's stonefly nymphs, caddis larvae, a lot of different things they can look up at, and there's just all sorts of water here. Probably the first mistake somebody would do here is to just walk right into this pool and fish over where a lot of the fish are lying. And I'm going to probably start by fishing no more than 15 feet right through here, tumbling a, a nymph rig right through here and just getting a drift, because those fish with the weather like today, they're down, there's not a lot of insect activity, they're probably nose around on the bottom looking for nymphs and looking for anything that's coming their way. And as you can see from the inside edge of this current, there's a slick, oily water. Fish love that. They don't have to work hard and they can just stay right through there and they'll even move right onto the heavier water also. I'm using a nine foot, five weight rod right here with a weight forward floating uh, five weight line. I like this rod because it's a full flex rod. The rod is flexing all the way down to the lower section. It's great for feel, protecting a tippet, and also for throwing the short, uh, accurate cast that you're using with a uh, nymph rig. Um, a lot of people you'll see will nymph with uh, strike indicators. Since we have probably caddis and stoneflies are the main uh, type of insect that we've seen here, instead of having an indicator, I'm using a Goddard caddis. Uh, it's probably a size 12. It's a high rider, I've got some floating on it. It's deer hair, it'll stay up, and it's got two advantages. I can use it as an indicator, but it's also gonna interest the fish. And I may be able to, I'm gonna be fishing two different levels. The fish may be interested in the dry fly tumbling through here. And then as you can see below it, I've got about three feet of 5X tippet, which may sound light, but with a rod like this, you can really protect the light tippet. I've got a double tungsten bead stonefly. It's a size 14, it's a little yellow Sally stonefly. This will fish underneath the indicator and tumble in the, in the uh, current. And with the dry fly as an indicator and that underneath, we're going to be fishing two levels. Fish can be looking up at a dry, and sometimes when they see that, they'll be interested in the nymph. So you've got two different opportunities at two different levels to interest the fish. Again, that's 5X, and I'm using a fluorocarbon for a tippet, which is really, it's a finer tippet, but more import importantly, it doesn't have color. The fish don't really see it, and I find it works really, really well for a, uh, the dropper fly on a nymph rig. And again, as you can see from this water, the maximum line we're going to be fishing with is 30 feet. You're just putting short, accurate cast in, and the key is to have a drag-free float all through here. 
and watching that dry fly behave like a natural is the best way for you to get a good drag free, free drift on your nymph. And he took the um, stonefly underneath, not a big fish, but again, they're interested, they're looking at that right behind. There's a lot of slower moving water where the fish don't have to work too hard. They've got a protective slime, so I'll just go right to the hook, since we're fishing barbless. Grab the hook shank. There you go. One thing you can do with this goddard, it's skating it, it's sinking a little bit, so even that wake seems to be interesting them. And I think they, they roll up that, they see the stone fly underneath it. Some of these are real small fish, but where there's little fish, there's big fish up here. Put a little more line out to get where the fish haven't seen it. Let it dead drift down. Then you can kind of skate it. That was a good strike right there. He ate the goddard. I think it's a good sign they're getting a little bitter. Actually, he's on the sofa. I thought he ate the goddard. You can see the beautiful color of these fish. Oh, sorry. The little tap right there, nothing to be proud of. The nice thing about a goddard, too, at the end of a swing, since cat has skate a lot, you can put some action on that, move that goddard around to maybe entice a strike, and that stonefly nymph's going to look good. There we go. There's a little fish. But again, the way you wiggle that nymph, they get interested in both the top and the bottom. This could be the smallest fish caught on Awesome Lake today. There is an incredible variety of nymph patterns available to fly fishers. In my travels, I have always found that there are six patterns which seem to work for me everywhere. In no particular order of precedence, my favorite nymph patterns are the Prince Nymph, the Zugbug, Hare's Ear, Pheasant Tail, Red Fox Squirrel Tail, and my top producer created by Ian James, the Muncher. All of these patterns can be tied with either bead heads or have the weight added into the bodies. To learn the recipes for these patterns, please visit us on the World Wide Web at www.thenewflyfisher.com. The Grand River flows through southern Ontario and over the last decade has become known as one of the top tailwater fisheries in the east. Huge brown trout of up to 30 inches have been caught in stretches of the river, especially near Alora and Fergus. On a beautiful July day, I joined renowned guide Ken Collins, who also owns the popular fly shop Grand River Trout Fitters, located in Fergus, to do a little bit of fly fishing. He gave me some excellent information and technique recommendations for nymphing, which is a very popular means of catching browns on the Grand. I'm doing a nymphing procedure around these boulder fields out in front of me. This boulder field is submerged by about three feet, and the boulders are about the size of uh, Oh, I don't know, put three 10-pin bowling balls together out here. And there's probably about a half dozen of them out in this run. And I'm just trying to orientate my drift right around them, beside them, be in front of them, in back of them, and just get a nice, at the same speed as the river presentation by them. It's very important to get that exact same speed match. If you don't get that speed match, you are getting a presentation that doesn't look natural in regards to the mother nature's way. Because you could you imagine a little nymph with a 150 Merc mo horsepower motor on the back of his behind? I don't think that exists. So why do you want to make a presentation that looks like one? I've been around amongst a lot of fly fishers in my days, being with guiding them or just talking with them in the shop or or actually paying for guides myself throughout the world. But the idea behind it is a lot of times there's emphasis put on flies and rods and reels and lines and leaders and tippets. They're all important, yes, I agree. However, I believe that nine tenths of the law of successful fish catching comes from presentation. 
And the one thing about presentation is that it takes a long time to get really good at each one of them. You know, there's dry fly presentations, there's nymphing presentations, there's streamer presentations, there's wet fly presentations. That's a lot of different ways to put a fly into a piece of water. So it takes some time to get good at each one of them. But one of the things that I find most important on getting knowledge on what is a good presentation and bad presentation, of course, if a fish comes along, that's, that's a good indication that you had a decent presentation. But besides that, until you do get a fish, one of the things that I find very important is to not rot. Don't stand in the exact same location forever and ever and ever. Just take the odd little micro step and move just a tad, but notice that I've moved very, very quietly. Do not run through the water like a raging elephant. That's a bad thing to do in a trout water, I'll tell you. That'll put down a batch of fish for a long period of time. I don't know if you're noticing, but the way I'm actually doing this nymphing presentation that's trying to get real deep along the bottom of this little run here is that I actually start the cast by just a quick little roll cast upstream on a 30 degree angle. And then as that line comes back toward me, which inevitably it's gonna because the water's pushing it toward me, I raised the rod tip. I didn't raise my arm and got out of weird position. I just raised the rod tip. Watch this again. I raise up the rod tip at the same speed as the river pushes the line toward me. And then as the line goes past me, I start to lower the rod tip. Again, notice that the speed is almost continual at the same speed as that river. Do not try to reinvent speed. Use those oxygen bubbles that are floating down that river. Use those as an indicator whether your line's drifting too fast or too slow. One of the other little guide tips that I like to emphasize to my clients when they're out angling for themselves is that at a certain point, as the fly is going downstream of us here, I have a little tangle of mishap happening here, I think. I better tend to. Okay. Once the fly is in the water, and at a certain point, just as the line's going down out beyond us here, I'm going to have a little bit of line to feed it. And this is called a kick and feed. And kick and feed. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to extend my drift downstream. I use that a lot when I'm fishing steelhead in pocket waters because it allows me to cover just one more little big piece of water without moving. So again, as the line's just about to start moving, I kick and feed a little bit of extra line. And that just gives me about another five feet worth of coverage down there in that little tail out of this run. That's a very nice little way to add just a little bit more presentation. Again, raise up the stick and lower the stick and then kick and feed. And there I go, extending myself down through that entire little run right down to the top of the tail out. Of course, no fish, but that's all right. If this was called fishing, I think we got it right. But it's not called catching, now is it? I'm looking at this run in front of me and I'm going, you know, I think I should just try to touch down a few presentations just a little bit farther away from me. I find that once you start to tickle about two rod lengths, almost three rod lengths out in front of you worth a line that a high stick format doesn't work that well. So what I ended up doing there is I ended up putting uh, a little piece of strike putty, um, just the appropriate depth, which is about one and a half times the river depth, estimated, mind you, and uh, up from my fly. And now I can start reaching a little further across that stream. And because I have that little orange strike putty out there, um, I get to see if it's traveling the right speed through that current. Because you'd be surprised how much that current is trying to manipulate this presentation on me. And if I can't stay in control of it, I'm doing a bad presentation. Remember, nine-tenths of law of successful fish catching is a good presentation. Can you see the boulders underneath the water? Oh, 
Oh, how about the fish? Take. That was nice. Right around that boulder. Eventually, it would pay off with a fish. Happens to be a small one again. But if it's good enough for a small one, it's got to be good enough for a big one. Nice orange fins. Recently on Spring Creek in Pennsylvania, I joined one of the best nymph fishermen I know, Jeff Blood. Throughout his youth, Jeff fly fished in both Pennsylvania and Ohio for everything from brown trout to steelhead, and during this time became an incredibly adept nymph fisher. I spoke to him on the banks of Spring Creek about how he likes to use a grid system to systematically fish a given section of water. The way I got started into nymphing was with my older brother who took me through the basics of the insect's life cycle and explained to me that the insect lives in the water uh, about 90% of the time and out of the water about 10% of the time. And there's a greater abundance of insects in the water. Therefore, uh, your percentage of catching fish is to fish under the surface of the water uh, rather than on the surface. So with that, uh, as a kid, liking to catch a lot of fish, um, I decided that that's where I would spend a lot of my time uh, fishing was with nymphs and learning how nymphs react in the water, how they swim, what their life cycle is, where they live. Um, the water temperature and how they react to that was part of the practice of learning how to do the sport. Once you master the technique of casting, um, that's only a small percentage of fishing, actually. Uh, it's your approach to the water that's um, critically important. And uh, fishing that water productively is the key to catching a lot of fish. When you make a long cast, um, even though you might be casting 15 to 35 feet, in nymph fishing, you're actually only fishing a distance shorter than that because your line has to uh, sink to the bottom, uh, get into the position, and then as it's coming through the, uh, the drift, you're losing uh, part of that drift. Even though it looks like you've cast uh, 30 feet out, you're only really getting uh, maybe 15 feet of drift on that. So what I like to do is to grid the uh, stream bed and um, my approach to the stream is, is probably what is most convenient to get to the stream first, uh, but then from there it is how to position myself to fish most productively and read the water. So uh, I, I normally try to start where I believe the f most of the fish will be lying and um, creep into that so as not to disturb it, starting nearest to me and then working my way out. And I normally start at the head of the pool and work down uh, maybe 10 feet. So I'll make a couple of casts into the pool. I will uh, make a couple of casts closer to myself and a couple of casts out from that same position. I'll take a couple of steps downstream and repeat the process. Make a couple of casts close, a couple uh, right under my line and a couple a little farther out and step down a few more feet um, and, and work through the pool. Sometimes I will work all the way down through the pool and then wade back to the top of the pool and take a couple of steps out in the line that I just fished through and fish it through again and maybe do that four or five times. You'll be surprised how many fish are actually in a pool uh, where some people will approach it and catch one or two fish, abandon the pool and move on. Uh, if you fish it thoroughly, you might catch 10 to 15 fish out of the same pool. Last winter, I attended the Isaac Walton Fly Fishing Show in Toronto, where I met the well-known author and instructor, Gary Borger. Gary was presenting a series of educational slideshows, and I asked him a few questions regarding nymphing and how to properly read the water in order to find where fish lie. Reading the water is often thought of as simply finding fish in lakes and streams, but in reality, it's also interpreting current flow to, so you can choose the correct casting and mending technique it's trying to understand something about the kind of fish that you might have in a water system. Some fish occupy one water speed, other fish may occupy a different water speed. It's knowing what kind of insects might be in fast water versus slow water. In other words, we're, reading, we're really reading water more or less to plan our strategy for what it is that we're doing. Now when you're reading the water, 
what you're really looking for are places that, in streams now, not lakes and oceans, but in streams when you're reading the water, you're looking for places that fish hold. These are called lies, L-I-E. There are three types of lies. There's a sheltering lie, there's a feeding lie, and there's a prime lie. A sheltering lie provides only shelter. Fish that are there are not going to be feeding, but they've gone there because they're trying to find cover. That's where fish go when you hook them. So if you know where a sheltering lie is, you can anticipate beforehand when you hook the fish where it's going to go so you can anticipate beforehand how better to play the fish. A feeding lie is generally in shallow water, and it's a place where a fish goes strictly for feeding. You're not going to find any shelter there. So if a fish is in a feeding lie, it's very spooky. The edges of riffles, the edge of pools, the shallow water at the top of a pool where the water dumps in. Any shallow water is over top of a weed bed. Those are all good places for feeding lines. Okay, a fish there is going to be shy, and it's going to be, when you hook it, like I said, it's going to go for the sheltering line. A prime lie combines both of the other two. So a prime lie would have food, but also have protection. So a good place to find a prime lie, for example, might be at the top end of a pool where deeper water dumps in. Fish could hold under that fast water coming in and watch for food coming down. Another place you might find a prime lie would be under a bank where a current goes back. A current going under the bank would carry food back in there. Another good place to find a prime lie is in riffle water. Any riffle water over knee deep is all prime lie. Could be fish any place in there. Another good place for a prime lie is on a seam where currents of different speed meet. They'll create a seam in the water. A seam is always turbulent water because the water's mixing. Turbulent water is slow water. So because of that, fish can hold in the slower water. So what you're looking for, if there's no hatch on, prime lie. If there's insect activity going on, fish will slide out of the prime lies and out of the sheltering lies and get into the feeding lies. So then in, in the hatch, I'd be looking for prime lies and feeding lies. I'd also be watching for the sheltering lies because those are the kind of places that fish are going to go when I hook them. A hooked fish will also go to a prime lie because a prime lie has both shelter and food at the same time. So when I'm reading the water, what I'm really looking for all the time are not only the places that I might find a fish that's feeding, but also anticipating what, what's going to happen to that fish when I set the hook to help me hook play and land. Plus I'm looking for, for places to stand to cast. I may want to change position because a particular kind of lie might have fast water on one side and slow on the other and I need to reach the fish across the slow water not across the fast water and so on and so on. So reading the water is more complex than just finding fish. It's trying to put all the pieces of the puzzle together so that when you finally lay the fly down on the water that it does what you intend it to do which is to look alive to the fish so the fish will take it. There is an incredible array of techniques and equipment setups related to nymph fishing. I strongly recommend that you pick up some of the excellent books and videos related to the subject, as the more information you're armed with, then the better you'll do streamside. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. To order a copy of your favorite new fly fisher episode, contact us through our website at www.thenewflyfisher.com or call us at 613-836-8295. Copies of this educational series make an excellent gift for your favorite angler or friend, and they also make a good addition to your reference library. $14.95 for one VHS tape, plus shipping and handling. Order three tapes and only pay $39.95, plus shipping and handling. <laughs>